Thank you for the introduction um, and for moderating uh, tirelessly this uh, behemoth year after year. So the, the title of the talk is Lifting the Veil of uh, Hope and Hype. Um, and uh, you know, there's clearly a need to approach the data that's emerging now with more um, clarity. And the, the direction I'll be taking on this talk isn't to meticulously go through every study and point out its shortcomings. Um, I'll be speaking impressionistically of um, many of the more recent studies that have been done, and then giving a personal story um, regarding my work with ketamine and what I've seen happen to ketamine. Um, so I don't think we can talk about research without also considering what happens with the research and where the data go. So let's start with um, the great pollinator, um, as, uh, <laughs> as Rick calls him. Um, so the first time I heard uh, science, uh, psychedelic renaissance, psychedelic revolution, in the pages of um, you know, that instruction manual for anarchists everywhere, the New Yorker, and um, you know, I, I immediately felt like, what's, what's happening here? What, um, what, what kind of renaissance is this uh, referring to? Um, and furthermore, uh, while we all recognize that change is needed, is the change promised um, in the pages of the New Yorker the kind of change we need? So also be um, looking at the data from that perspective. How is it being stewarded in a manner that is congruent with the promise that we all recognize this work um, has? So let's begin by uh, examining the world we live in, some of the assumptions we make. Um, we have a palliative, passive mental health culture, low emphasis on responsibility, reciprocity, communal engagement. Materialism is the dominant metaphysical myth. Experience is mechanized and standardized. Healing is a commodity. Pharmacotherapy is central to psychiatric treatment. Psychiatric diagnoses are assumed to be discrete and valid conditions. Problematic social cultural systems are secondary concerns. And we have reductive binary notions of drugs, good drugs, bad drugs, et cetera. This is also the world we live in. We have the lowest per capita number of mental health workers in the world, um, increasing rates of overdose, depression, suicide, anxiety, socioeconomic inequities deepening. We're the world's most active purveyor of war, the most prolific producer of military technology. And we have 25% of the world's prisoners incarcerated in our facilities. So clearly, change is needed on many levels. So what is research? Scientific inquiry, um, but it can incorporate many things and cannot be subsumed under one heading. Um, and nor are all data created equal. So I want to go over some of the types of research that have um, occurred in the field. Exploratory, you know, we don't really have any question in mind. We just go in and start looking at patterns. Um, naturalistic, longitudinal, you follow what's happening in the real world. Open label, we give a medicine um, under ideal conditions, see what it does. Mechanistic, we examine what the, me what the medicine is doing, again, with, with the materialist model being the, the dominant framework. Efficacy, um, under ideal conditions, what's the medicine doing when compared to placebo or some active control? Effectiveness, how does it fare in the real world? And implementation, we discover that something might be helpful. How do we make sure that it reaches people in an equitable and responsible way? Um, research is also a human endeavor. You know, we don't mysteriously suspend the facts of being human when, when we engage in research. Um, it's not detached from our epistemic existential coordinates. Uh, many of the same pre-assumptions that inform our cultural systems, cognitive constructs go into research. Um, and there's a strong relationship, even at hallowed institutions like Columbia, where I'm based, between existing systems of capital accumulation and biomedical research. Um, and the same forces that propel other products into the marketplace, um, coordinated marketing, profit concerns, targeted audience, scaling, are at play with biomedical research, often from the very first studies. So research to date, um, early studies have been preponderantly cross-sectional, naturalistic, 
um, open label with wild promise, um, neuroimaging studies with tenuous findings, um, animal studies of dubious relevance um, to human beings, um, the randomized clinical trials that have been uh, funded in whole or part um, have been funded by organizations with an interest in introducing so-called psychedelics into cultural medical landscapes with or without profit. Um, many of the investigators who work in the field have a similar perspective, for better or worse. Um, there are well-recognized methodological flaws um, pertaining to blinding, specifically proper controls, outcome assessment, modulating expectancy. Lack of diversity in stu study samples to date. Um, and implementation research is non-existent, um, including for ketamine, which, you know, more research is coming out by the day regarding how effective it might be for various psychiatric disorders, but um, no effort to understand how we might scale it in a way that's equitable. So that's the research today. I said it would be impressionistic. What I wanted to focus on was my kind of observations with ketamine. Ketamine I got into um, research-wise <laughs> because I, I was interested in, um, in a medicine that's uh, freely available, cheap, um, non-commodifiable, um, easy to incorporate into medical settings at present, legal, um, and with the propensity to uh, change paradigms of healing, uh, particularly in relation to its psychoactive effects, its capacity to create windows of opportunity for, for behavioral change. Um, so the research of a psychedelic sort that's been done with ketamine, um, been done by my group, among others, um, a single infusion, when incorporated into um, a robust psychotherapy framework, has effects on depression and addiction that can sometimes persist for quite a while. Um, the model, while psychedelic insofar as we investigated psychoactive effects, made space for them to emerge, more properly psycholytic in that the therapy was central um, and the medicine was intended to move the therapy along. Um, and psychoactive effects are important, um, as has been seen with other um, substances, including serotonergic hallucinogens, um, particularly the mystical type phenomenon. We, we found uh, that ineffability, the capacity for um, the experience to be completely unrenderable into words, was highly correlated with um, therapeutic outcome with alcohol use disorder specifically. Now, what's happening with ketamine currently? Um, you know, with the data kind of being methodically, rigorously um, collected, the zeitgeist has descended on the marketplace, and we have a lot of clinics and uh, of various types emerging to, to meet the needs of people who are interested in legal psychedelics. Um, the first row, Nushama, Field Trip, Mind Bloom, take, a, take a, an overtly psychedelic stance and promise people an experience. Um, there's really colorful um, decor uh, when visiting the places. Um, there's emphasis on the experience itself being very therapeutic and helpful. The second row is a much more medical framework. It focuses on ketamine as, a, as an antidepressant, as a novel antidepressant. Um, so, you know, they, they take different, model, uh, different kind of paradigms in, into, uh, um, into consideration when administering ketamine. But there's something that links all of these together, and, and that's um, money. So these, these are all places that are focused on making money, on capitalizing on the zeitgeist, and um, not perhaps being as mindful um, of some of the larger concerns we were talking about when thinking about the larger potential of these substances. Um, so ketamine is now um, being touted as something that is unheralded in psychiatry, uh, worth trying at the very least. You know, if you have a little bit of anxiety, that's fine. Go to a clinic, just let them know. They'll find a way to get it to you. Um, you know, psychedelics are, are similarly um, being trademarked as a thing to go for, you know, another product. Uh, really potentially helpful for various conditions. You know, if you can't wait for them to be um, product um, ready, then you can go to Costa Rica, perhaps find an underground um, provider here if you have the funds. Um, innovative de depression treatment is another um, way that ketamine is being um, sold. Um, again, relying on data when, when appropriate, um, not necessarily always. 
And there's dubious experience and expertise at the helm with anesthesiologists who have never really provided any kind of psychotherapy or concerned themselves with psychiatric diagnoses coming to the fore and providing care, hyped up marketing, promising people psychedelic experiences, um, life-changing transformations, getting in touch with your inner healer, whatever that might be. Um, there's, it's pay for service at exorbitant cost. Um, uh, there are, um, I think, uh, places giving infusions for $1,000 a pop with um, uh, the request that there be package purchases up front, at least three or four infusions. Um, there's little evidence for this practice, but it really makes good sense um, financially. Um, wellness is another um, way that the, the data have been um, infiltrated, let's say, with the so-called transdiagnostic benefits of these substances offering opportunity for wellness to be seen as um, a psychiatric good and something that we should aim for and, and market accordingly. Um, this has led to promiscuous off-label use of ketamine. Um, and of course, the breakdown of indication-driven treatment is, is good for business. Um, as, as I said, you can go and say, you know, I have a vague anxiety issue, could you help me out? And um, assuming the funds are there, you'll, you'll get what you need. Um, data and evidence are only um, kind of invoked when convenient. Um, and a clear exploitation of the psychedelic zeitgeist. So what is psychedelic experience? Um, you know, it, it, people are paying attention. We're go kind of going through all of the different um, modes that we've organized our healthcare, all of the different assumptions that have organized our paradigm, and, and thinking about them critically. So when we're talking about experience, people are very quick to say, well, now we're not you know, dealing with material stuff anymore. We're talking about real experience, subjectivity. Um, but what happens if we reify a specific mode of experience, if we're focusing on a particular um, phenomenon as the thing to aim for? Isn't that a new mode of materialism? So yet another mechanized linear account of treatment. You pass through this particular transformative or psychedelic experience and then you're good to go. Pretty soon we're going to be probably having ego dissolution trademark like everything else. Um, and pharmacotherapy remains central. Um, you know, what exactly is preparation, guidance, and integration? Um, psychotherapy is, in my research and the research done to date, an important part of this process. Um, but in the emerging ketamine clinics, and, and um, unfortunately in the forecast of how these substances might be incorporated, we have ideas of virtual reality, automated treatment, etc. But where is the person-to-person -person engagement that has been so crucial? for these data being as robust as they had been. Um, and again, these simplistic platitudes, transformation, the inner healer, a journey, spiritual healing. Um, and you know, we also have platitudes in science with uh, neuroplasticity, default mode network, kind of quieting down the room whenever we mention them as if we've you know, um, uh, spoken gospel. So we have the same old systems. The clientele are preponderantly well-resourced and white. Um, expensive training programs run by apparent experts. Um, McKetamine clinics are emerging um, <laughs> within cities, across state, even national borders. Um, and it's a veritable gold rush with priorities being fiscal growth, scalability, expanded markets, and reduced costs. Um, then the same binary notions of drugs, you know, psychedelic exceptionalism, as my colleague Carl Hart calls it, that these drugs ain't like other drugs. Um, even ketamine has been thrown under the bus to, des to preserve a certain dichotomy, um, protect a privileged drug class. I've heard certain researchers refer to it as psychedelic heroin. So now more, a more nuanced, balanced approach to all psychoactive su substances now a matter of lip service now, rather than actual practice policy. So it's business as usual. The only change is a collapse of psychiatric heuristics in wellness-oriented spa clinics to catch a bigger market. Um, thoughtful discourse, evidence-based practice, clinical rigor replaced by buzzwords, new age platitudes, and psychobabble. Um, it's a more expansive materialism um, with experience itself now objectified. Even a medicine costing pennies, as in the case with ketamine, can launch a feeding frenzy. So what should we expect from medicines backed by industry, watched closely by investors? 
you know, we often hear, you know, when the mushrooms come, everything will, will fix itself. But um, perhaps we should pay attention to what's happening now. And I really appreciate this, uh, this line from Pliny. For this is no excursion from it, but is the thing itself. Thank you.